Psalms for Beginners, this is lesson number five, and the title of this lesson is uh, Word Psalms. Um, mentioned so far uh, in our study that most psalms can be categorized into nine different types. Now you can find other you know, one-offs, if you wish, one particular psalm that talks about one particular topic, but most of them are grouped in nine major uh, groups. Wisdom Psalms, Nature Psalms, Word Psalms, Penitential, Worship, Suffering, Psalms of Assurance, Praise, and Royal Psalms. So far in our series, we've looked at Wisdom Psalms, and we've said that Wisdom Psalms seek to define the character of a good man or a life or actions uh, in given situations. What ought a person to do? What is the character of a good man? Who, is, who can approach the Lord in worship? So those are wisdom psalms. Last time we talked about nature psalms, which comment on the greatness of God as it is revealed through the completed act of creation and God's continued activity in it. And that's very important. Not just the fact that God created everything, that is a subject of praise that we have in nature psalms. But if, you know, when you study and look at nature psalms, what you see is that the writers are also glorifying and honoring God for His continued involvement within His creation. Not just spiritual involvement in the sense of sending Jesus you know, for our salvation, but His physical activity within the, the creation. And nowhere in the Bible is this idea brought out more than in the nature psalms. So tonight we're going to look at a third category and these are psalms dealing exclusively with God's word itself. So those would be word psalms, word psalms. These are psalms that praise God for His special revelation to us, which is his word. Not only the word is given to us, but what the word actually reveals to us. A device used repeatedly, aside from parallelism in these types of psalms, are the use of synonyms for the word of God. All kinds of different words referring to the word of God. That is the major device used in word type psalms. Now last week we studied how David combined two psalms into one, two types of psalms into one psalm. Half of it was a nature psalm, the, the second half was a word psalm, and that would be Psalm 19. In verses one to six, David praises God for his wisdom in creating a world which gives testimony to his power and his greatness and putting this great creation in the hands of man, the frailest you know, within the, you know, the smallest, frailest creature that he has created, he's put the creation, the responsibility for it, if you wish, into his hands. Um, a vast thing like the heavens reveals God's vastness, and a small thing like man made in his image reveals his character and that the great big thing is put into subjection to the small also shows that his, not only it shows his wisdom, but it shows that his wisdom is not like our wisdom. And we learn that lesson over and over, don't we? You know, uh, my way of fixing this problem is this way. You know? And then when you wait a bit and you see how God fixes it, you realize his ways really are not our ways, okay? Um, in verses 17, so we, we said that in Psalm 19, the first six verses, they're a nature psalm, declaring God's wisdom and power, so on and so forth. In verses seven to 14 in Psalm 19, David continues to praise God for the way God reveals Himself and glorifies Himself, but this time he demonstrates how God does this through the giving of His word. So verses one to six, how great he is, how wise he is through the creation. Verses seven to 14, how great and wise he is through the giving of his word. 
This part of the psalm is divided into two further parts. Uh, you have the description, purpose, and value of God's word, verses seven to 11, and we'll read that in a moment. And then the second part of uh, that section is a prayer of petition, verses 12 to 14. So I've got a kind of a diagram here because it is a very complex, um, a very complex uh, construction for this particular part of the psalm. So let's look uh, at three things in verses seven to 14. You have descriptions of God's word. You have value being described, and you also have the purpose of His word. And so the description of His word, the, 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 the complexity of it, the greatness of it, He talks about that. He also gives a value to it and the purpose for it. So let's first read the first couple of verses. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. So there you have a couple of verses. The author here, if you haven't noticed, uses six synonyms to describe the word of God. So let's take a look at these. First of all, he says the law. So what is the law? Well, the commandments and the ceremonies given by Moses in the Pentateuch, the law, in verse seven. Then he mentions the testimony. The testimony are the things that the word has spoken about. The, testi the testimony that the word has given about who God is. The testimony that the word has given about what salvation is and how it is obtained. The testimony in the word that talks about relationships between people, relationships between God and man. The testimony. Another word he uses in verse eight, the precepts. Those are rules or guidelines that are, that are contained in the word. For example, the guidelines for the priests, how they were to do their work. Those are precepts. In verse eight, another word for God's word, the commandments of the Lord. These are general principles that encompass everyone, not just the priests or a certain group of people. The commandments encompass everyone, and if violated, they affect everyone. Thou shalt not steal. That wasn't just for the Levites. That wasn't even just for the Jews. That's for everybody, the commandments. Another interesting synonym that he uses is the fear. So this one needs a little more explanation. The, 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 uh, when he says the fear, that is the thing that God's word produces, which is said to be the same thing as the word itself. That's another, um, another device called metonymy. Metonymy. Uh, I'll give you an example in English. We owe our loyalty to the crown. If you're an Englishman, well, is your loyalty to the crown, I mean to the thing, to the, the metal thing with the diamonds in it? Well, no, you mean my loyalty is to the wearer of the crown, the king, the queen, metonymy. Well here, uh, the thing that God's word produces, fear, awe, okay, is said to be the same thing as the word itself. So the fear of the Lord, the thing that it produces, is used for the word itself. They're interchangeable in this. So the awe, the reverence, the religion that is actually produced by the word, all of this, compressed into a single word using the device of metonymy, the word fear. And then he uses the word judgments or ordinances. Some of your Bibles may have the word ordinances. This is the sum total of his word, the summary conclusions of what his word teaches, the ordinances. So here in verses seven to nine, you had descriptions of God's word using various synonyms, law, testimony, precepts, commandments, fear, judgments, all of these things describe God's word. 
in the same verses, the author also gives a value to God's word. So let's read it over again, this time paying attention to the value that he gives to God's word. So in verse seven, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. So the author here describes the value or the character of God's word and its preciousness for the one who accepts it. So let's go back to our chart and let's take a look in verse seven. So we had a description, the law, right? Well, what value does he give to it? Is perfect means it is complete, it is lacking it nothing. It is exactly what God intended it to be. The law of Moses, what David was referring to, did everything that it was supposed to do. Perfect. Next, the testimony of the Lord is sure. There's another value judgment, meaning dependable, accomplishing what God wants. God's word never fails, it is sure. Next, in verse eight, the precepts. What does he say about the precepts? They are right. And this word in the Hebrew comes from the Hebrew word straight or well. The idea is that the word of God is pleasing because of its rightness, its soundness, like a bell you know, or some, sometimes your, your motor, or some people have an ear for things, oh, that thing is off, you know, it's, I can hear it rattling there. That's a, some people who really know mechanics, they can tell their motor is not operating, you know. It's not sound, it's not operating the way it should. Here, in the same way, the author is saying, God's word, you know, is sound, you know, it's, it operates exactly as it, as it should. In verse eight, again, when he talks about God's word as commandments, he says the commandments are pure, the value, pure. No impurity, no mixture of falsehood and truth together. No uh, synergistic, you know, God's word is not synergistic. It doesn't bring in a whole bunch of different religions, if you wish, as is the case with many other Eastern religions, especially. The more gods you have, the more you know, the history, the more mystics you have, the better it is, like a stew, let's all bring it on in. One of the problems with missionaries in India for a time was, that, oh, they were baptizing thousands. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> because from their point of view, Jesus, he's God, sure, let's go. <laughs> we, we, you know, let's just make sure, let's make sure we got all the gods we need. God's word doesn't produce that kind of religion. That's the point. His, his word is pure. In verse nine, the fear of the Lord is what? Clean, no ugliness, no contamination, and no deterioration of it. Then he gives two values here. In verse nine, the judgments, he says, are both true and righteous. True, the epitome of truth. Uh, the word of God has been tested, it is straight. There's no, there's no falseness in God's in God's word. And it is righteous without sin. It is totally acceptable. Now you're noticing there's some overlap here. Well, obviously he's using, you know, he's using synonyms. So there is a certain amount of overlapping in the qualities that he's assigning to the word. He goes on in verse 10. He says, God's word is precious, meaning more valuable than any material thing. And he talks about gold, you know, better than fine gold. At the time, the most precious commodity at that time was gold. There wasn't anything more valuable you know, per ounce, if you wish, than gold. And so he's saying more precious, not just than gold, more precious than fine gold, you know, gold that has been treated and has been refined, more precious than that, okay? Uh, and also he says in verse 10, 
pleasing, more delightful than anything that can be consumed. And he uses honey as an example. And honey was a rare thing in those days. Not everybody had honey. You know, the, the kings had honey. They're the ones that ate the honey. It was an expensive commodity. Sweet, today everything is sweet, right? Medicine is sweet. <laughs> everything has sweet in it. But in those days, something sweet wasn't part of the culture like it is our culture. So something sweet was something rare. Honey was something rare. It stays with you. It changes you for good. So in the few verses we've looked at, the author has talked about God's word. He's used, he's used several synonyms for his word. And then he's given a description of the, of, the, of the word, of God's word, using different synonyms. Then he's assigned a value to each of these concepts here. Perfect, sure, right. He's going to do one other thing, again, in the same verses. He is also going to talk about the purpose, what the word accomplishes. So let's go back once again, read the same verses, but this time focus on the purpose, what he says the purpose is. So the law of the Lord is perfect. Description, right, value. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul, purpose. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. So he gives the practical, the practical benefits derived from knowing and obeying God's word. So let's go back over these in our chart. The law is perfect and what does it do? It restores the soul. The word accomplishes what it sets out to do in that it converts the soul. The person who knows and obeys God's word is changed, restored into the image of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure and makes the simple wise. In other words, gives wisdom. So God's word is dependable. Even the naive and simple can have confidence that it will give them the wisdom and the insight that they need to navigate in this world and of course to find heaven, to go to heaven. Verse eight, the precepts right, are right. And what do they do? They make the heart rejoice. The word has the ability to cheer and encourage because it offers what? Well, it offers assurance, it offers comfort. You know, if, if I doubt my salvation and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not a good guy and I've failed here and I'm not doing as well as I can and I wonder if my sins are forgiven, I, I don't debate with myself, I go back to the word. Wait a minute, the word said that if I believed and I was baptized, the word said that if I repented and I was baptized as well, Acts 2.38, my sins were forgiven. It didn't say some of them were forgiven, it says all of them are forgiven. That, that hasn't changed. I draw comfort from that idea when I'm not sure of that particular thing. If, if people are close to death and they're, they've been faithful, and they, you know, but you know, they have a moment of hesitation, what, what a wonderful verse Romans 8 chapter one is. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those words are very, you know, when you're 16 years old and full of health and vigor, those words don't mean a lot to you. You may have to remember them for a test. But if you're 89 years old, if you're 92 years old and you're very ill and, and you're, you're close to death, those words are extremely encouraging. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The precepts are right, they rejoice the heart. In verse eight, the commandments are pure, and what do they do? They enlighten man's eyes, man's 
impure mind is purified and thus brought to understanding through the pure word of God. Verse nine, the fear of the Lord, he said, is clean and what does it do? Provides assurance. Again, like I say, there's overlap. Not only the word, but what we learn from it has permanence. Whatever we know and are assured of in the Bible will always be. I remember when I was a kid where we lived, the lady, uh, it was a boarding house, and the lady who, who, um, who owned it, her favorite saint was Saint Philomena. And every year, she was Catholic obviously, and every year she would buy a calendar with Saint Philomena and all the pictures of Saint Philomena you know, on it. And, she, and they would go around and uh, you know, raise money for the church that was called Saint Philomena you know, in her neighborhood. So, and and her, her, uh, her, um, her day, you know, every day of the calendar, you had one day, and I forget when it was, in June or something, it was Saint Philomena Day, you know, that day was Saint Philomena. So she was all about Saint, her patron saint, that's what I was looking for. Saint Philomena was her patron saint. Then somewhere around the 1960s, <laughs> the, the Catholic Church did some house cleaning. Because after all, there's only 365 days in a year, you know, uh, but there are a lot more saints than that. And so some saints were desainted, were no longer saints anymore. And, uh, whoa, she was not a happy person. I mean, they changed the name of her parish and the calendars didn't come around anymore and now they had all these newfangled saints that didn't speak French. Little did she know that St. Philomena probably didn't speak French either, but you know, you know what I'm saying? It was like, uh, I'm not making fun of her. What a disappointment. Her religion, much of it was tied up in this fascination with and this devotion to this particular historical character who was a saint and she prayed to the saint and please, you know, uh, she would offer her prayers to that saint who would then bring them to Jesus. You know, that's how it works you know, in, back in those days in Catholic uh, practice. And her, it was like her whole spiritual life was destroyed because the thing she counted on her whole life just got, you know, they had a meeting in Rome and that was it. See ya, St. Philomena. Now, if you're wondering what's the point here, <laughs> the point here is that what we learn from the word will always be. Jesus Christ is the Son of God in, 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 in 2017 and in 3002, Jesus Christ will still be the Son of God. And in the year 4016, there will still be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Well, once we learn something, we understand it from the scripture, we may deepen our knowledge of it, but it's not going to change. We have that assurance. The writer says in verses 10 and 11, the word provides protection. The word provides protection from spiritual death as well as physical dangers by warning of the destructiveness and the repercussions of certain actions, certain sins. And then in verse 11, the word provides encouragement. The word warns, but it also promises and describes the rewards awaiting those who believe and obey what it says. So the author reveals the greatness of God by describing the word in its various forms using synonyms, the law, the testimony, the precepts, so on and so forth. And then he describes the value and the characteristics of it and what it accomplishes in man's life. All in just a few verses here. And what I see here is the, the potential for teaching in just a few verses. I could take up a whole hour just describing these three or four verses <laughs> in one single psalm. Then in verses 12 to 14, as I said before, the author makes a prayer of petition. 
So in the final three verses, he asks God to help him make a proper response to the word. So he describes the word and its value and its purpose, and then he asks God to help him in his response to the word. Verse 12, who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults, verse 12. Here he asks God to forgive or to clear him from hidden faults. At first he acknowledges that because he is human, he's not always able to know how he is sinning, how he goes against God's word. Have you ever realized that a lot of times, sometimes for a long period in your life, you're doing or saying or thinking something which is against God's word, which is a sin, but you're completely innocent in the sense that you don't know it's a sin, and then all of a sudden you discover that it's a sin. Oh boy, oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know, man, I better not be doing that. So he's saying to God, please, you know, <laughs> acquit me of these things that are hidden even from myself. That's the reason why it's not good to boast. <laughs> not good to boast. So at first he acknowledges that because he's human, he's not always able to know how he's sinning. So he prays that God forgive him of sins that he makes that he's not aware of. You know, only the believer can pray this prayer because he is under the state of grace. It's so futile to try to save ourselves through perfect behavior. Because even if you know 10 bad things about yourself that somehow through self-will or practice or whatever you manage to overcome, guarantee you there'll be some stuff that you don't even know about. <laughs> so this is a, an interesting prayer that he makes, but it's also a good prayer for us to make as well. You know, Lord, I, I don't know all the dumb stuff that I'm doing. I don't understand sometimes the things that I don't know. You know, he doesn't even know what he doesn't know. Have you ever heard people say that about someone? He's not aware of what he's not aware of. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. That's a bad place to be. So this author is you know, speaking this idea a long time before it became popular in our culture to say this thing. In, verses, in verse 13, he says, also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. So he asks God to restrain him from committing presumptuous sins. These are sins that he commits knowingly, either because of rebellion, selfishness, passion, weakness, but not because of ignorance. So the first thing he says, please forgive me for my ignorance. Forgive me for the sins that I make that I don't know about. And then he says, and please help me, restrain me from making sins that I do know. I do know something is wrong sometimes and I just can't help it, I do it anyways. Help me with those, that's presumptuous. When you know that it's wrong and you go ahead and do it anyways, that's presumptuousness. Now the Lord doesn't stop us from these, but through His word and our conscience and the Holy Spirit and the church, He can alert us to the danger. He warned Cain, didn't He? He said to Cain, hey, you better be careful. Sin is at the door, you need to master it. He knew Cain had a murderous rage going on in his heart and he warned him of it. He could have stopped him, right? He could have broken both of Cain's legs so he couldn't move around for a couple of months or years and maybe cool down a little. No. He did not deny him the exercise of his free will, even if that exercise of free will caused harm, because there's a judgment to come. So here David asks God to help him not be a slave to the desire or weakness of sinning openly against him. Here's a guy who's got confidence. I want to tell you, I want to have this guy's confidence. He knew the danger of these and the need to be freed from any enslavement to these kinds of sins. Notice the synonymous parallelism in verse 13. 
Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let that not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I will be acquitted of great, you know, being blameless and acquitted of transgression, same thing, synonymous parallelism. One more verse, verse 14. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He prays that God accept the psalm that he is writing. He prays that this offering be acceptable to him. He begins with the quality and purpose of God's word and how precious and productive they are to him. Now he ends by asking that his own words be acceptable to God. Again, a beautiful balance you know, of ideas. He begins with God's words to him. You know, God's word is pure, God's word is this and that. And then he ends with his words to God. I hope my words, God, coming up to you will be acceptable. Beautiful. He ends with the declaration that God is two things. A rock, dependable, solid, indestructible, strength, and redeemer. In the Old Testament, this idea of the avenger of blood, the kinsman redeemer, no police force in those days. If someone was killed in your family, murdered in your family, someone in your family would go look for the person who killed him and would take revenge. And throughout Israel, there were cities of refuge where someone who killed someone, perhaps accidentally, would run to, not to hide, but to take protection so that if the avenger would come, a family member coming to exact justice, if he would come to the city, the city fathers would have a, you know, a trial, more or less, bring evidence and you know, work things out. And usually what would happen is the person who is guilty of the killing, whether accidentally or on, you know, on purpose, he, he, would, he would be judged and, and, uh, and executed. But anyways, uh, he would have to stay there till the, in that city of refuge, he would have to stay in the city. He was safe so long as he stayed in the city. But if he left the city, he could be, he could be killed just, justly. Uh, but he'd have to stay in the city until the death of the current high priest. When the high priest died, then that would automatically free him, parole him if you wish, and he could return to his home. Very interesting. So one who takes revenge on the enemy, meaning here, the redeemer, God is my redeemer. God is the one who takes the revenge on my enemies. He's the one that cares for my family, and so on and so forth. Ultimately, God is our avenger. He redeems us. What does it say in Romans 12? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We need to say that. The, the reason that you, pay, you pray for your enemy is because God has said to you, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I pray for my enemy and I say, God, please have mercy on him. All right, Psalm 119 is the longest Psalm in the book of Psalms and the longest chapter in the Bible. This psalm is an acrostic, and if you remember what an acrostic is, you know, where every line or so begins with the subsequent letter in the Hebrew alphabet, that's an acrostic. I mean, not in any alphabet, you have English acrostics and whatever. Uh, interesting, the psalm is an acrostic where the first letter of every eighth verse in this psalm has a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So that's 22 times eight equals 176 verses. So it if it was in English, the first verse would start with the letter A, a word with the letter A, and then the eighth verse would start with the letter B, and the 16th verse with the letter C, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now in Psalm 119, there's no progression of thought or coherence but rather a general theme throughout, and that is praise for God's word. The psalm uses 10 different words as synonyms for the word, five of which are found in Psalm 19 that we just looked at. I just list these for you. The word law, testimonies, those we saw, ways, statutes, commandments, ordinances, word, precepts, promises, and judgments. 
There is a synonym for the word in almost every single verse. Imagine 176 verses and in every verse there's a synonym for the word of God. In verse 105 of this Psalm, probably the best known and probably summarizes well the theme of this entire Psalm. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. A lot of posters with that in people's bedrooms. <laughs> Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. So word psalms are meditations and expressions of praise and appreciation for the value and the character of God's word revealed to man. And I've picked two, Psalm 19 because it's so unusual and Psalm 119 because of its length and beauty. All right, so that's uh, word psalms. Surely we could find more things to say and more word psalms, but as I said, we're, we're just picking one or two out of each category to give you a, an idea, a flavor of what these are like. 